Shall we have a go on lecture 20? I hate to interrupt all these great conversations. Uh, I promise to stop after an hour. Uh, um, so this is lecture 20, which is where the main theme is the finite element method, but I have uh, a continuation, completion to, to, to do of lecture 19, and the, you'll see the link right away uh, when finite elements come. Uh, I just indicated up here, section 3.6 is where this calculus of variations is summarized. And then finite elements, you'll easily identify that section further along. Uh, but this was where we were. So at the end of lecture 19, we're looking for the best u of x to make this quantity small. And we identified the key principle is move away a little from u of x, move away by some probably, I th I'm thinking of v of x as a small perturbation. So v of x I'm thinking of as a small function in any direction, positive, negative, and our quantity would become this. But this is supposed, if, if u is the winner, any v is supposed to give us something bigger. And now what do I do? Just the way in calculus there was always a, a subtraction. So I, so I look to see, okay, what's the difference between this one and this one? And do you see, because practically, I mean, that term is copied here, and this term is copied here, so, and that term was copied there, so what's left, what's the V of X term? Well, there's the one-half C of X, du dx dv dx with the two, because we square that sum, so the one-half cancels the two and leaves us with that. So that's the, that's the linear term involving dv dx, and then of course there's the v of x, f of x term, and then finally you could say, well, what about the one-half dv dx, and that's the quadratic term. Okay. And that's supposed to be, if u is the winner, then for any v, this is positive. Uh, you see that this equation I'm writing down is the same as the equation in calculus would be zero is less than or equal to f at x plus delta x minus f of x. That's that's what's identifying the the best best guy, and we, it will lead us to the equation in, in calculus. It led us to the equation df dx equals zero. At, 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 at the winner. Now, coming back to here, what can I conclude? For any V of X, this stuff has to be positive. And out of that, my, I'm trying to produce an equation. Okay. Well, this has V of X, fine. That has the derivative of V of X. So any suggestion, how can I... How can I deal with that? I, I would rather see v of x there. That would be beautiful, because then I'd have a v of x in this term, and I'd have a v of x in that term. Excellent. Yes? Right. So I want to, yes. So what's the opposite of a, a, a Integrate by parts. Exactly. Exactly. That's what I want to do. I want to integrate by parts. So this term, I want to replace this by, now what happens? So I'm going to, I'll separate it into these are my two parts, right? I integrate by parts. That always produces a minus sign. And it takes the derivative off of V, so it leaves V alone, and puts the derivative onto this. So it's, it's the derivative of that. Right? And then you could say, wait a minute, there's some boundary terms in integrating by parts. There's a boundary term. There's a, there's a C, of, C of x, uh, du dx, v of x, 
between 0 and 1 that I should watch for. Okay, I, I admit that. All right, but let me just be sure. Let me let me deal with that later. Was that okay for integration by parts? And then now I've got a v of x. And now I can combine that with this v of x, and 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 put them together. So that all that stuff is multiplying v of x and integrated. And then this is the boundary term that I'm fudging on for the moment. Okay, now what do you say? I'm damn near done. That's right. Because what this quantity is supposed to be always positive. So what's my conclusion? It's, it's supposed to be this thing is this thing is never negative, no matter what v of x I choose. It has to be zero. It has to be zero. It has to be zero. That's the conclusion I want. That, that's the key, that's the fundamental lemma of the calculus of variations. When you get this expression that, that, has, that, has, that can never be negative, only positive or zero, then since v of x has sign, either sign, the only way, you know, if, if this is ever non-zero, we can give v of x, which we're free to choose, we can give v of x the sign, the same sign or the opposite sign. We can choose the sign of v of x and, and get a contradiction. So that's the conclusion. This has to be zero. And that, this quantity, this integral, this integral, Oh, no, this quantity, sorry, not the integral. It's the, it has to be zero at every point, because we could choose v of x. That's the, this is the dp du that we were looking for. Only I'm using, it's the first variation rather than the first derivative. We just use the word variation as a reminder that uh, we're dealing with functions. We're in continuous variables. The, 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 so the big moment has just is just there. Okay. There is. Good. Uh, what happened to this guy? Yes. No. You're absolutely right. So there, there are two points that I have not dealt with. One is that one. So let's deal with that one. Okay. Now, how to deal with that? The reasoning is always the same, that this thing, we're, our reasoning is that this thing has to be greater or equal to zero for all v. And out of that, we want to conclude that this thing has to be zero. That's this fundamental fact. Now, how, what's, our, how, what's our thinking going to be? Why, why can we forget this? Which, well, yeah, but... It, it, it's always positive. That's right. But we, we, this business. How do we, how do we deal with it? Well, you probably say I don't want to hear any more about calculus. But uh, how did we, how did we deal? With, the difference between these was was delta x f prime of x plus, then there were really more terms, weren't there? There was delta x squared over 2f double prime. That's, that's the kind of term we're looking at here. But how, why was it that the, this thing had to be 0? And that, that it, I didn't have to worry about this stuff. Let me, let me, give, let me answer the question. Take v, since v is arbitrary, take it very small. Take v to be whatever sign we want it to have, but quite make its magnitude really small. Then what? It's, it's, that's, so that's the good idea there. Think of V as just a little change. Then if this wasn't zero, we would get something, right? We'd get something in this part. And we'd get something here, but it would be second order. So, so it, the sign of this would control. It, it, there's a subtle 
uh, not deep, but, but there, you asked exactly the right question, and the answer is that because this has a v squared in it, when I think of v as being just a small perturbation, this guy can't, doesn't affect our reasoning. It, it, it's, it, it, it's true that it could be positive, but it's positive and so small compared to the other one that it's the other one that's, that's, that's uh, in charge. Sorry? Oh, yeah, I, that's true. Maybe I want to take V's smooth as well as small. The, the beauty is I'm, I'm allowed any V. And, and so that's what the limit says. When you get that much freedom, the only way out is for the thing that multiplies V to be zero. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's a, you're, you're making a, a good point that, well, I could, V could be small, but, but I mean, a, a mathematician might say replace V by epsilon times V. So let, let, replace V by epsilon V, and then this would, be an, would have an epsilon squared in it. Do you want to see any of that? No, that no. I, I, the sorry, if. Oh, it's right. Oh, yeah, but is C negative? Uh, yeah, no. I I built that in way back at the original oh, problem. C was positive, just the way our matrix capital C was was had to be a symmetric positive definite diagonal thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, otherwise, you know, Ohm's law would go backwards and the world would blow up. Okay, right. Um, yeah, but that's you're you're absolutely right that 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 if c, in other words, let me let me say because you're quite right. If c of x is not positive, then we don't have a minimum. We've got a saddle point. We've got weird stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So c is definitely positive here. Okay, uh, and then this. Uh, how about this fudge? Uh, this, I shouldn't have used that word on tape. Uh, how about this point? Uh, well, um, what's going to deal with the boundary terms? The boundary conditions. I, I intentionally didn't mention those. But, of course, this problem comes with boundary conditions. It comes. It, it might come with the boundary condition u zero at both ends. And then what would what would happen? Then the v would have to be zero at both ends. The the admissive the, the functions that are allowed in the competition have to be zero at both ends, and then that boundary term goes away. I it, it, let me just. No, because that because the boundary part could take could extend this part of the lecture. Let me just say that it's the boundary conditions that, as we saw in 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 the A and A transpose discussion a month ago, it's the boundary terms. When we integrate by parts, there's boundary terms, and it's boundary conditions that deal with them. So they knock this part out. This part is small because it's epsilon squared. And this is the conclusion, then. This has to be zero. And this is called the Euler equation. OK. Actually, I, I can even say one more thing. Before we, before we got to the conclusion that this had to be zero, we were at the step where this integral with the v of x in it has to be zero for any v satisfying the boundary conditions. So, uh, can, I, can I do a distinction here between three statements of the problem? One is the minimum statement. Minimize a quadratic over a whole bunch of u's. The second is this, this is, I'm going to call this the weak form of the equation. Weak because it's still got the v hanging in there. That the integral of this quantity times any v is 0 is the weak form. And then 
I'll call this Euler equation, I'll call this the strong form. Where the V is now out of the picture, and this quantity and the integral is not go is gone. We're just at every point this has to be zero. Do, do you see a, a, a distinction? Let me I'm going to move pretty quickly now to finite elements and Galerkin's principle. And Galerkin's principle is so basic and it's built on this weak form. That's why I wanted to, to pause uh, and, and mention this. Okay. Uh, th let me just s step back a second. I, I think I've probably said everything I want to about the calculus of variations. Only, I've only done one example. But that example does really exemplify the typical situation. A typical, so here's, here's C, a calculus of variations. Minimize some integral of some function of u of x, du dx, maybe x itself, dx. That would be, there is a problem, a more general problem in the calculus of variations. So, minimize any function of, of a function. You see where we have a function of a function. The unknown is, the, is an unknown function. And it comes in, its derivative comes in, its second derivative might come in the, um, into the problem. It partial derivatives might come in if, we, if it was a function of several variables. So that's what the calculus of variations is about. How do you minimize functionals? And, and the way, what happens is you go to, you move u by little v, you look at the linearized term, it has to be zero, and that gives you the Euler equation. So that, this is the, this is the more general, not necessarily quadratic, like if you wanted to find the shortest distance between two points, you could use the calculus of variations to show. Sure enough, it's a straight line. Yes. Right. That's right. That's true. When, you, when I move it by a little bit, the difference has to be greater or equal zero. But then what's that f next crucial step? That when I look at the linearized part, the part that just multiplies v alone, that has to be zero. Yeah, and that's the, the tricky point. The, the, that's the tricky point, that, that, that this higher order stuff can be forgotten because, because, because I look at very small v's. Yeah. Okay. That's so... Uh, so I'm just describing the whole calculus of variations here in this tiny corner of the board. The main point is that it's the general case of which this is the best example. Okay. Are we ready for finite elements? Yes. And I'll work with that same example. So what's the finite element method? The finite element method makes this problem finite dimensional. By not allowing every function u and every mo movement v, but only a finite family of u's and v's. So that's the, that's the key idea of finite elements. And, and that's the big decision is what what, uh, so now I'm ready for finite elements. So here come finite elements. Or the Galerkin method in general. The Galerkin takes, we want to get a finite problem. And how do I do it? I only allow these u's, which are combinations of, with unknown coefficients, 
of some basis functions, n of them. So I only, I only minimize, you see, I'm, I'm sort of down to this finite dimensional space. Instead of minimizing over every u, which led me to this differential equation for the absolute winner, I'm now going to take a subspace winner, a limited winner, by choosing just a few functions, or maybe a hundred functions, but not all functions, and I'll only allow those winners. So now these are chosen. We hope chosen, we hope well. That's the big, big decision. It's, a, it's so much of applied mass is, okay, what are the good trial functions? These are the trial functions. Because those are the ones we're going to try. And other functions, if, if, the, if the absolute winner has, uh, they could be like sine x, sine 2x, sine 3x, up to sine 100x. That would give us a hundred functions. And then this would be sort of like a Fourier sine series of the winner. But if I choose that, if I make that, is that a good choice? To take those functions, sine x, sine 2x, up to sine 100x. What I'm going to do then, I'm going to plug this into the problem, right? I'm going to pr plug that into the minimum thing and minimize, but w minimize, I've only got, these are my unknowns now. The weights are the unknowns and unknowns. So I've got a hundred unknowns. I I'm not too crazy about that choice of sine x, sine 2x up to sine 100 x. Why not? because the calculations would take a long time. I'd have to be able to, do, to compute this integral for functions like sine 100x, and then minimize over this 100-dimensional space. And the idea of finite elements was a better choice, instead of using sines and cosines. What's a, what's a better choice of trial functions? And, Exponentials, you could say, okay, plug those guys in, but still you have these integrals to do. Uh, so when Galerkin suggested this idea, well, the computer, of course, didn't exist. So n, n was three at the most, probably two, right? In other words, so Galerkin, would have spent a lot of time trying to get, because he's only choosing two functions, he would try to get two functions that were pretty close to the, to the real winner. Of course, the real winner is unknown, but he would, he, he would work hard to try to find functions that were close to it. If we, if we deal with a Fourier series and we take a hundred or a thousand terms, well, we don't have to worry. Are we, have we got a good approximation? We can expect, yes, we probably have. If, if, our, if we've taken a thousand Fourier terms and we find the best thousand weights, we can probably come darn close to the true U. The, but my complaint about the Fourier choice was the cost of computation. All right, so let me, let's invent the finite element method here. Uh, give me, a, 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 suggest some other functions. Uh, sorry? Polynomials. Okay. So the, I could take the functions 1x, x squared, x cubed, up to x to the 99th. That would be, then my space would be all the polynomials of degree 99, that 100 dimensional space. I could minimize. Uh, okay, you're going to, okay, so, so with, with that polynomial, what do you think? 
Is that a is that a good choice? I think not the best. Okay, so you have another. Uh, uh, so you're going to take functions. Yeah, now you're going the right direction. Okay, so you're going to take functions that. Is this the kind of function you're putting in? Okay, so this is what Walsh thought of. So this is the Walsh's functions. Uh, sorry that somebody. <laughs> well, we'll add your name also. Walsh plus. All right. Uh, okay. All right, but yeah, uh, this is, you're you're absolutely right. Can I? Am I allowed that function? The derivative is a problem. So you 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 caught me out actually. I said any function, but I, I really overdid it because that because the step functions have the derivative is a delta, and here we're squaring the darn thing, and we would get infinite energy. So I really should have required that the function that I, the, I need the thing to stay finite. So now you're, you're take one more step and you've invented finite elements. Yeah. So instead of piecewise constants, which have a jump, and the derivative is a is a delta, which which blows us up. What shall I take now? Piecewise linear. Piecewise linear. So now switch to. Linear finite elements, they would be called. Piecewise linear. Linear pieces. Linear elements. That's where that word elements is coming in. OK, so my, my functions are, are the, the functions I'm allowing then are, are any piecewise linears like so. And now everybody sees that we've made our life much easier as far as calculating these integrals. Because we've got pretty darn simple functions, and we can integrate a piece at a time, an element at a time, and in that element, the thing is actually linear. So, so I can do these integrals. That's the beauty of it. So piecewise linear is good. Now let me ask you, what's the basis what, in, in, in this language? What would the what's the base? What's You've given me all the functions at once there. All piece. So suppose the boundary conditions are u of 0 equals 0 and u of 1 equals 0. OK. And suppose I chop the thing into 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 elements. So that I had really, so I really have four degrees of freedom. So n is 4 here. But now tell me the four basis functions that you want me to use. Yeah. OK, that's what Walsh did. He made them look like sines and cosines. So, so maybe one of his functions would have gone up, and then another one would have had an oscillation, and another one had two. I'm looking for another option, another basis for Another set of four fees whose combinations give those. Sorry? I, I'd be happy if they were, but I'm more, that's good, but I'm, the most important is that the calculation should be fast. So I'm looking, make them as simple as you can. And, the, and your choice of making them look like sines and cosines was pretty simple, but let's make them. Okay, that's possible. That's possible. Well, but yeah, okay, I could. Yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm gonna let's look some more because this is exactly what what the. Any, any more suggestions? Yeah, yeah. Interval, by interval. interval by interval, piece by piece. That's the winning idea. The, the, here's one of our functions. 
And then here's a second one. And they, uh, well, they, they didn't, yeah, sorry, I better, I, yeah. So, so they do overlap, and I don't get that orthogonality. But I, I just, I'm prepared to live without it for, the, for this local. To, to be local is, 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 is to be up to date. I mean, that, that's really local stuff. That's what you'll see with wavelets, too, that they're a local basis. So there's one guy. The second guy peaks at point 0.2. The third guy peaks at point 0.3. The fourth guy peaks at point 0.4. And their combinations give anything. Let me, no, I hope not. Let's see. What? Uh, it's a it, it's a shift. It's a shift. It's true. A shift is okay. Uh, but if I uh, if I multiply that by two, I, it would just make it bigger. Yeah. If uh, uh, you're uh, all this is the right stuff to think about. Is exactly the right stuff to think about. <laughs> If I, if I combine this with this, then I can get anybody who does this and then stops. But then I've got number three and number four. They'll pick up it, it, somehow. OK. That's one way to see that these four guys are independent. That, in fact, the, the C's actually have a meaning. The, the C, the C1, the one that multiplies this guy, is actually the value there. This, that's the C1. And this is the C2, that height. And this is the C3, it happened to be negative, and this is the C4. Do you see that? That if I, if I take those things, so the, these weights are actually point values, which is kind of nice. So all I do now, well, yeah, what I want to do now then is I, I'm limiting myself to this four-dimensional space of, of simple functions, and these would be piecewise, these would be linear finite elements. And now, where is my equation going to come from that determines these C's? Right now we've made the big decision of the basis. And, and those other bases you mentioned, I mean, like, you know, they're, they're, those other bases are not dead. It's just finite elements is that choice. Well, finite elements don't have to be linear. We could, we could imagine parabola, little pieces of parabolas or little pieces of cubics. So those will be quadratic elements, cubic elements. Uh, those are all, it's highly interesting. I mean, it, it, there was a, like a golden age of finite elements when everybody was creating new bases. And of course, everybody hoped that his basis would be, you know, that his name would be like immortal. Uh, and a few people probably, well, piecewise linear, somehow, I guess nobody's name got associated with it. And that, that's... Uh, a very important choice just because it's so simple. Okay, come back to that question. Where are my equations for these four C's? How do I find the best C's? I, I, you see, I've, I've decided, okay, I'm only going to allow functions that are combinations of these four C's that look, look like that. Now, what's the best one? How do I get the best one? Sorry? I need a cost function. OK, so what's my cost function? I guess it's this guy. OK, so, so one way to do it is plug this into there and minimize it. It's a function of four variables. I'm back to the beginning of the last lecture. n is 4. You, you, you imagine doing that? I've decided what these functions are. 
So those are fixed. Those are my trial functions. Those are the ones I'm trying with. What I don't know is the four coefficients. So I plug it in to the thing that I'm trying to minimize, and I minimize, but I've only got four variables, so I've, I'm there. Okay, that's, that's the Rayleigh Ritz. That's associated with the names of Rayleigh and Ritz. Galerkin had another idea. Galerkin worked with this weak form. Galerkin said, okay, now I'm looking at this. This, is, oh, uh, uh, this whole thing in yellow, let me put the zero in yellow too so that we're seeing the whole weak form in yellow. Okay, so what, and the integral is there. Um, so now what's Galerkin's idea going to be? I, I've got I've got this u is now a combination of, from 1 to 4, of c i phi i of x. And I've made a smart choice of these phi's, and smart means that I can do the calculations quickly. Ooh, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. If I put these piecewise linear functions into this form, what is going to happen? Problems are going to ha arise, right? Because the derivative of piecewise linear is, is piecewise constant. And here I've got another derivative. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So what should I have done? I, I, I just screwed up, but, but in one line, by changing that arrow, I can make myself correct. Let me get this term. That was the, so I'm going to put equals zero here. OK. Do you see what? I want, this is the weak form. That's the weak form. With before the integration by parts. And now I could take u to be my piecewise linear, and the derivative would be piecewise constant. That's fine. And what about the v? What shall I take for v's? Well, I, can t I, I could take the same things for v's, or I could take some other choice for v's. But, but this is, so I'm sorry that that's in yellow and this is in white, because this is the one that I should have been pointing to. That's the form before I integrated by parts and, and uh, imp imposed this s additional derivative on u. This was much better. So, well, I think probably the simplest idea is let this it has to be true. So u is a combination of these, now again, of 1 to 4 of these ci, phi i's, right? And what shall I take for v? I, I'm looking for four equations. So, so I'm just going to take four v's, four test functions. Yeah. And let them be each of these, right. It's true for every v, so I pick any four v's. And one natural choice in this sort of symmetric problem is let the test functions be the trial function. But I don't have to make that choice. So can I summarize this Galerkin idea? He's got n. He chooses n trial functions, phi i. And he chooses n test functions say psi, well, if I don't know how to say that word, but j of x. And those could be the same. Very often they are the same, but they needn't be the same. And then his equations are this weak, he takes the weak form where he takes v to be, in turn, one of these psi's. So this is for j equal 1, 2, up to n. Uh, 
we got to n equations in n unknowns. That was our job. We've got to n equations in n unknowns. What are the unknowns? They're these weights. What are the equations? They're the weak form for each uh, test function. So we're testing it n times. And this, this is going to, that's four equations and four unknowns. That's k c equals f somehow. I, 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 let, let, let me, you see, this c is my four unknowns, my vector of four unknowns. My K is somehow a matrix that's going to come out of these integrations. My F is somehow the, ma the, the vector that's come, going to come out of integrating the linear terms. And everything depends on the choice of the fees and the, test, the trial functions and the test functions. But do you see that it's a pretty reasonable principle? We, we can't, Galerkin says you've got to make a finite problem. And the way to make it finite is choose some functions in advance and look for the best combination. Then, then you have only n unknowns. And then how does he get n equations? He tests the, 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 the equal zero condition against n test functions. And those test functions could be identical to the trial function. That, that's Galerkin's idea, and the result is um, a set of linear equations. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me now say, okay, let's step back. All right, so suppose we're going to write a finite element code. Can we, let's not actually write it, but Imagine we're writing one. What what would be the subprograms? What would be the subroot the, the the pieces of a of a finite element code? Maybe we could list those pieces. If if we were writing a code, what would we? Uh, and, and you know that the finite element that there are giant finite element codes that have had hundreds of, of people years in creating them. Nastran is one name you may know. Adina is created by a guy at MIT and a, and a generation of graduate students. Um, and there, are, there are ten, maybe five to ten really big, big time codes. So what do they have? Well, one step is going to be choose the, choose the fees. And, and maybe, and, and the fees. There'll be a library of choices. And the, and the first guy in every library is this one. It would be fun to tell you about some of the other possible fees, but, but if, but, all right, so we choose these fees. Now what? what? What do we have to do? What's the next job? We've made this choice. We know what we're, our equations are, but we've got to turn them into a linear system. So the second job is assemble F. Assemble the matrix K and the vector, and the vector F. Maybe I'll, yeah, and the vector f. In other words, plug these things into the integrals and do the integration. That's the expensive part of the finite element code, and that's, that's why we chose simple functions to keep the cost down. We have to assemble these matrices by doing the integrals. Then thirdly, we solve. K, C equals F. That's if we've taken 10,000 elements or a hundred or a, t a million elements, that might take some time, but, but
but uh, it's under control. And then finally would be uh, display uh, this the our our best our 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 our, uh, our approximate u our our, our approximate answer uh, this combination of of trial functions is yes that's that's right it's nothing to do with that c of x yeah would I be better I would be better to call these Unknowns UI. Yeah, that would actually be a lot better. Should I? Could I? It, it would. It would be a lot better to to be to be uh, for the UI to be the the weights of the fees. Why is that better? Because finite elements actually has this wonderful property that these guys. Yeah, you would have been a heck of a lot better there. Because, because those, because u's are actually the values of my approximate. So you could say this is the approximate guy, and we hope it's true and close to the, to the real one. You see what we did? We minimized or we worked in it over this finite dimensional space. So we arrived at a finite problem, k u equal f instead of a differential equation. So instead of a differential equation, we got to a finite matrix equation. But the job was to figure out the matrix. So that's the stiffness matrix. And this is the load vector. And, and to see what k is, uh, can I just say what, what's a typical member of k? And then y you've really, it's been a long, uh, day. I'm not going to go over long on this, but what's a what's a typical what's the i j entry of this matrix k? It will be. It comes from this. It's the integral of c of x d phi i d psi j. Yeah, I'm plugging into the weak form, and the k part comes from the quadratic part. What's the what's the load uh, k? It would be the integral that will come from the linear part. It'll be the integral of psi k. Is it psi k? Yeah, I think times f of x the x. All I've done is plug in the, the u's and the, and the v's and uh, did the integrals. So it's these integrals that, that are involved in assembling the in producing the matrix. And hopefully those integrals are not hard. I mean, how would you actually do these integrals? What's, what is d phi i dx? It's just piecewise constants. It's just two little constants over a little piece of the interval. And what's, oh, what's, what's the derivative? Let's take the phi's as, and the psi's as the same. So this will be another piecewise constant. Okay, so what's up? What, what kind of a matrix K am I going to have here? Yeah. Oh, boy. You got it. You got it. First time. Absolutely. I thought when I asked that question, I thought I haven't made it clear enough, but it, it, thanks. It's tri Why is it tridiagonal? Dare I ask? The, because they partially overlap. Because they only, right. This guy only overlaps with when, I, if I is different from J by more than one, there's no overlap. So that, that local basis paid off. They weren't quite orthogonal because this guy and this guy do overlap. But it's tridiagonal, and that's, that's fine. I mean, 
if everything was orthogonal, then we would have a diagonal matrix because all the other inner products would give zero. But that's tridiagonal. It's just as good as diagonal, practically. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So that's – so it's these – it's these calculations that uh, – oh, all right, now, what are, what are we going to do with this C of X? Are we going to actually do the integral exactly? Probably not. If C of X – if we do have some variable medium so that C of X really depends on X, the, the, the conductivity or, or whatever that physically represents, if it's – if it's changing continuously, hey, we're not going to – we would approximate that by piecewise constant or piecewise linear or something. We, all we want is a good approximation to those integrals, these and these. Then we would solve KU equal F and we would have a darn good approximation to the answer. So that's the – the whole idea of finite elements was making this kind of a choice of trial functions. That's, that's really – and real – and then creating the, the multi-million dollar systems that would do it um, – do all the calculations for us. Yeah. Can I just ask you to move for uh, – these last minutes move into two dimensions? Suppose we had a partial differential equation. These are double integrals dx, dy, and there would, be a, uh, there would be a y derivatives in there. Our functions are functions now of x and y. Can you invent finite elements in 2D? What, what's a good what's – what's an invention of a two-dimensional finite element? These were great one-dimensional finite elements. This one and the next one and the next one and the next one. Now let me draw a 2D region. I'll make it a – okay, some, some two – well, some two-dimensional region. Might be an air, aircraft uh, uh, surface or something. It, it, pyramids, brilliant. Right, pyramids. You, you would cook this – you would – now, here's the beauty of it, though. I don't have to use this equally spaced mesh. I'll just create any kind of mesh that fits the edge of the – that fits the surface of the, of the plane in a nice way. Or maybe where I expect shock waves, I'll put in a whole bunch of little elements. That the, the great thing about this idea is it's so local that I can – that the geometry can be very general. Okay, and now where's – where's uh, – tell me again what, what's the pyramid just before I – because it's exactly the right word. Yeah, yeah, we've got it's, – it's got triangular faces, and I don't care if it's four of them. It's, it's – at every, at every node, we raise a pyramid. So we have piecewise linear. In, in, every, in every plane surface, it's an AX plus BY plus C. It's linear – it's piecewise linear. Piecewise linear and continuous across the pieces, across the boundaries between elements. Yeah. And the basis functions are pyramids, which is a 1 at that point and 0 at all the other nodes. Yeah. Darn right. Add that here. Mesh. Big, big part of the system is setting up the mesh. Because even in the linear, you have the nuclear spaces that you have to They didn't have to be. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That's the, you have great freedom in the geometry, but you've got to keep track of it. Yeah. And then you've got to – and then for each – each one is local, and then, of course, you've got to keep track of where, where it is. You've got a little local coordinates to tell you the, the little local integral, and then you've got to – Assemble all those pieces. So uh, this is actually what you do. You, you assemble this matrix K by a bunch of little local integrals. It's, it's uh, oh, it's a, it's a big world of uh, computational mechanics, whole journals. 
We'll see a matrix. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we'll see a matrix our, in this 2D problem. Our, our uh, uh, approximation is a combination of some functions, which will be the pyramid heights at the point, times the pyramid functions. Uh, at the nodes of my grid. So I have this grid, and I should have made it proper triangular grid. Uh, we could deal with rectangles and create some other functions, but piecewise linear, it goes with triangles. So I create, so I take this region and divide it in some way into triangles, and then for every node, I have a basis function which is a pyramid, which is one at that function and zero at all the other nodes. One at that node and zero at all the others. That's true. Okay. The, you, we got n nodes, right, right. One to n. So we've got the, we've got that problem that, of, you know, really it's, it's uh, two dimensions being squeezed into one because I have to number. Yeah. We'll lose our tridiagonal, absolutely, right, yep. We'll lose tridiagonal because I can't do the numbering in such a way that neighbors stay neighbors, right. Exactly, right, right, exactly. It'll be sparse because the only neighbors that affect it, the only, in the row of the matrix that corresponds to this guy, the only non-zeros will come from the pyramids. The only overlapping pyramids will be the neighboring pyramids. Right. So it'll be sparse. It'll be block diagonal if I do it in a beautiful regular order. And what I'll get will look like it'll look like a five-point scheme actually. If I do a, rec a square mesh and everything very very sort of uh, in the obvious way my K will look like a finite difference matrix. So that's nice, you know, I, and there was a lot of discussion back in the 40s and 50s when, the, when these ideas came up. It, you know, that people said, is this just the finite differences in disguise? But no, it's got so much more freedom. It, it gives you an automatic way to deal with irregular geometry. <laughs> You, you create a mesh, you lay a mesh down, so you've got mesh subroutine number zero here, creating the mesh. And then you've chosen the elements, and, and then, then here's the cost, the assembly, and then the solution. Right, so it's not tridiagonal, that's a very, you, you really have seen so much here. Well, I mean, you're, yes? To N? Uh, let's see. Um, that's true. That's true. So n will be the number of nodes, and the number of triangles is, yeah, uh, there would be some, Euler would have figured out some relation between the number of triangles and the number of nodes, um, and the number of edges. Yeah, so that's, there, there's some neat facts. But n would be the number of nodes here. Yeah. Yeah. Any other thoughts? So we've really you've created finite elements. And uh, do I want to say anything about the history of the finite element method? Uh, this sort of idea emerged in several different places. Uh, people give uh, sometimes give courant credit for. Uh, uh, for it. In China, I met a wonderful old guy, Feng Kong, who, who invented it too. Um, but neither of these and, and, and other early people had any way to, they never thought about the actual steps of the code. I mean, really, this was all like prehistory. And then came the structural engineers who actually saw that it was a great idea, that it wasn't just a math paper, but it was a, it was a, it was a brilliant thing that's continued to grow. So 
These, this, these guys in the 50s and 60s did the translation of this idea into, uh, into a, something that really worked. You, I would say usually, but wouldn't have to. Yeah, usually would use the same functions for phi and psi, and often without especially thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. They, they, when they chose the element, they probably uh, chose chose that. Uh, uh, so I'll mention uh, some of the engineers. Uh, um, the the classic textbook in engineering uh, in this area is. Uh, 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 a uh, guy who was in uh, Polish, you'll see from the name, but he was in Wales, O. Zinkiewicz, and now there are other, the whole series of books. And then mathematicians like myself learned about the method, said, wait a minute, what's going on? Is that just a finite element method in disguise? How can you understand the, the accuracy? How close is this to the real answer? So uh, I wrote an early book called An Analysis of the Finite Element Method um, along with uh, my co-author, George Fix. So that was 1973. So you see mathematicians, as usual, just ended up kind of coming in too late to, to uh, and then there are other, other math books and many other engineering books. Um, Okay, that's 4.30. Thanks for uh, a good afternoon, and uh, see you next Thursday. <laughs>